Hello. Uh, yacht A. Eh? Yacht A. Isabella Robbins. Yuna Chef. Bilagana. Nishle. Hashgana. Zoe Bushishchin. Bilagana. Dasha Che. Do na kai dina and dasha nele. Nana ah hasana. De na sha. Ak ot ego dina hasana nishle. Hi everyone. My name is Isabella Robbins. Um, thanks Bob for that intro. Uh, introduction. Um, it's really nice to be back. So thank you, Half and Refer, Leah, Leah, um, Emily, all you guys. Thank you for inviting me back. It's really exciting. Um, that was the first time I've ever been like introduced as like a scholar, sort of. Like that was very exciting. <laughs> um, anyways, so yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again, um, and I wanted to talk a bit about a digital storytelling project I did. Um, actually, not specific to the exhibition that I curated, but the wall to, I guess you're right, um, with the map and the prompt, uh, what, are, what is the space that you want to protect? So yeah, I just wanted to go through kind of the inspiration for the, the wall project as well as the digital storytelling project, um, the process of that, and then just go through the actual digital storytelling project. I'm just curious, have, has anybody seen the project online? Okay, a couple of you, so that will be good. We'll go through it. Um, and then kind of just end on with some of the challenges that, have, uh, that, we, uh, that we ran into with this project. Um, but yeah, I just really, again, wanted to thank Leah Burgeon and Emily Jackson. They were definitely my collaborators in this project. I think the whole theme of both of these ex exhibitions has been collaboration. Um, with the communities we were working with, with like water protectors, land protectors. Um, and I think that's just evident throughout the exhibitions, including this digital storytelling project. Um, yeah, so the first I wanted to start with kind of how we got the idea for the wall. Um, I actually don't want to call it the wall, it sounds very Trump, I guess. Um, but the, the map, uh, um, and I think it was we really just wanted to do something that connected these two exhibitions. I think there's some obvious reasons, which is, you know, they're both indigenous-led movements. Um, they're both, you know, protecting land and water rights. Um, but we kind of wanted to do something physically in this space. Um, and I think something that kind of sparked this, at least for me, was this image by Dylan Miner. Um, and it says, we stood with Standing Rock and we stand with Bears Ears. So it's obviously the very obvious reference to it being a piece about Bears Ears, but referencing um, Standing Rock. And I think, yeah, that kind of sparked sort of this connection, obviously. Um, it's on the, this image is also on the wall there if you haven't seen it. Um, yeah, so I think that's how the question started. We were also, I think, by nature of being public humans, uh, Leah Burgeon also graduated from the Public Humanities Program. I think we think a lot about how we can um, engage with our audience more. Um, I, I know from my background, particularly in art museums, it seems like there is a bit more of a divide between seeing the art and being an audience member. And I think that the Half and Refer provides a lot of really important opportunities and is an important space to kind of bridge that gap um, and sort of do these almost experiment-like things, um, which is what the map was. So yeah. Um, and with that came what's a, what's a place you want to protect and the map. And that was made, I think, in specific collaboration with the gallery guides here. I know Leah had conversations with them um, and brainstormed ideas as to how we could make this kind of something more interactive. Um, so as you can see the map and this beautiful gift by Emily, <laughs> um, it really just shows how people are interacting with the map and how many responses we got. It was really hard almost to keep track. We had to keep uh, taking things down, or not taking things down, but taking down the responses and kind of starting over. If we had left it how it was without ever taking them down, it'd probably be like, I don't know, you wouldn't be able to see the map at all. Um, but that was really cool, I think, because it is, you see how far reaching this is, I think. A big goal for this project was to take the themes in both of these exhibitions about protecting land and sacred spaces um, and kind of we wanted our audience to walk away with, you know, thinking about what is important to them, what is sacred to them and what do they want to protect. Um, yeah, and I think that's evident here. 
They, all their responses were documented in the notebook, in a notebook. Um, so we just took down the tape, we put it inside this notebook, and this notebook was very filled. <laughs> um, and we kind of just documented all of them there. And for a while, we didn't really know what to do with it. Um, and that's kind of how the digital storytelling project came about. Um, so with that, I, we kind of were like, well, we should at least start cataloging these things, right? Um, so I started putting them into a spreadsheet, which was kind of difficult for a lot of reasons. Um, not everybody has the nicest handwriting. Um, sometimes it was in other languages with non-English characters, um, which is obviously very cool, but I don't know what those things mean necessarily. Um, there was all kinds of hashtags, or sometimes people would do little drawings. Um, yeah, and I think something to note that I think was very respectful of our visitors is we never really had an issue with like vandalism or people writing offensive things, um, which is cool. So yeah, we ended up documenting them in this whole spreadsheet, and as of March 13th, which is several months ago, we had over 1,500 responses, which is a ton, obviously. Um, so I, I would assume that it's probably double that now. Um, yeah. So from that, we kind of, after documenting them and sort of having all these responses in one space, uh, we were able to kind of think of themes. Um, and those were uh, sort of like uh, the places people wanted. Um, something that was really interesting about this project was people really strayed from the, strayed from the prompt. Um, often people wrote things that they wanted to protect. Um, a lot of times people would write things like penguins and then stick it like in the Antarctic, right? Um, or they'd write, you know, calls to action like protect women or protect immigrants and stuff like that, um, which I think was a really, which was really interesting because it wasn't just one, you know, it was like kind of this, there was a lot of those things happening. Um, and then something really cool about this for myself doing this project is I definitely learned a lot about different spaces. Um, got a pretty good lesson in like Chinese geography, which was cool. Um, Cause I mean, there's just so many places in the world obviously, but I think just having, doing the act of actually reading every one of these responses kind of sparked something like that word or place became familiar with myself. I, I became familiar with that. Um, and then I do my own little Google searches and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so, and then media, we kind of had to choose, uh, we were kind of thinking of what, do we want videos in this? Um, do we want pictures, obviously? Um, and that was kind of sort of how we built the digital storytelling project. And um, eventually it was put into a slide deck, which is now online. Um, so, and there's Adrian. Um, so I just wanted to go through that with you and just so you have an idea of what it is. Yeah, so there's Adrienne writing her response. Um, and Jen's right there. Um, yeah, so I'll just go through it slowly and... Yeah, so here's kind of just, there was a lot of topics that were, or a lot of things that people wanted to protect that weren't just places. Um, and yeah, just wanted to show you like the amount that people were writing this down. So 117 people wanted to protect living beings, including, there's lots of gifts in this. <laughs> Fifty-one visitors wanted to protect things explicitly pertaining to the climate, like the ocean, climate change. This is kind of funny, but also really sad. Um, well. 
So yeah, I also, I think with this project, wanted people to see, kind of have that tapey like aesthetic to it. Um, yeah. I think that also emphasizes that that people were here and people were actually writing these things. Um, and I think it's cool to see the different handwritings too. I think that's really beautiful. Um, another thing was I, I definitely did want to bring it uh, back to Brown and back to Rhode Island and the place that we're in. Um, because yeah, it's sort of, we have the land acknowledgement and I think it's important for people to also know the, what's happening in their neighborhood. So Mashapog Pond was one of those. Um, and at this time, um, Makana was doing a lot of planning or with the Mauna Kea conference. Um, so that was kind of a specific reason why we chose that and included it in this project. Um, Wakanda came up a lot, which was really cool. Um, and it wasn't, usually it wasn't anywhere specific in Africa, just like there, <laughs> uh, all over. Um, and then home, that was one that we got a lot, which was really sweet. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's a video, I won't play that, but she talks about just living near the contaminated pond and um, the struggles and with that. And then Mauna Kea. And then something just to note that I think was a challenge with this whole thing and with the exhibits honestly, is that information changes so quickly or is updated so frequently. Um, right now, Mauna Kea, there's, I mean, they've been protesting, Hawaiian people have been protesting on the mountain for months now. Um, so it's obviously still something that's happening, but it, yeah, just the interactions on the mountain have changed and stuff. Um, and this is just a recap from uh, the conference again, but also I think showing that these issues, even though they're um, seem far away, they have a real impact to the people here. Wakanda, <laughs> which Brown did a some kind of like talk about that, which is exciting. Um, and then home. So we did get a lot of different responses, like home, my home, my house somebody else's house um, or somebody else's home, which is cool. Because, yeah, there's no place like home. Um, yeah, and, you know, as we know, people continue to add to the map every day um, or whenever the museum's open. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, to put a place that's important to you. Um, and along with this, we have not just the slide deck, but we also included the um, spreadsheet that had all the responses as of March, um, and then actual scans of the notebook, which is kind of funny because I didn't have one of the like book scanners. I had to like press it and put it on the thing <laughs> at the time, and it took like literally three hours, but it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the project, um, what it looks like, and you can find this on Brown's website. Um, and it just, I mean, like I said, things have changed, but it's got a lot of links to other things. Um, and I think most importantly, it, it shows sort of why these places are important to us here at Brown um, and in Rhode Island. And yeah, so just to end, a couple of challenges we had um, was deciphering responses. But I think another one that Leah, Emily, and I spent a lot of time talking about was difficult topics um, in particular and I think this is really important too, um, is was, it was interesting to see Israel-Palestine um, and how that was interacting on the map. People would cover the other responses. Um, it was obviously like a place of tension without people physically being there, but you could see it in the tape, which was really interesting. And we did have a lot of conversations about this. And I think 
you know, there is always a gamble with how much information you include in these exhibition type things. Um, and I think ultimately we decided that it, we couldn't give it enough nuance um, that it needed. I think now that would have been different because I know Brown just passed the divestment um, thing, which is really interesting. And that would have been something really, I think, important to put into this. But yeah, it just, I mean, it's a complicated topic, I think, for a lot of people, including myself, um, who comes from a family where it's not a topic we talk about um, because of certain things. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of, I had my own personal if, like challenges with that. But I think that was sort of one of those things for sure where we had to decide what, what was, it wasn't because it wasn't important, it was because it needed more nuance than what this platform could have given us. Um, yeah. So with that, I think all of that kind of exemplifies just kind of the whole theme is collaborating with our audience, which is really cool. Um, it was really interesting to, ha to see how the map grew, um, to see the sites of tension, to see um, the sites that were getting or the places that had a lot of the same responses, um, and also just the things, the non-place things that people were coming with. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it was, it was more than just kind of having this interactive section of the exhibition. Um, and we really did want to show that beyond that, as well as kind of memorialize it almost <laughs> online. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, it was cool. I had notes and then I just like didn't read them, but <laughs> I think I got all that I wanted and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, oh, I guess I had a conclusion slide, um, but yeah. And there's my email if anybody <laughs> needs to reach me. But thanks so much for coming and thanks for having me. The question is how do we start the, the process of these exhibits? Um, I've probably said this a million times to the public humanities students in the room, but a big part of it for me was just finding uh, visual material and how I did that was on social media. Um, I just followed the hashtag protect bears ears or I followed the protect bears ears account and it kind of just was this cultivation of a lot of visual material which was really cool so that was I think what that's how I worked uh, was that I, I worked from the material first um, and then kind of came up with some themes. And for Greg and I, this entire exhibit started with Greg's um, academic interest in the drone uh, photography at the Standing Rock Movement. And um, we had conversations around how it was a very visual thing that he was studying and that it would be really interesting to curate a small exhibit about uh, using the photography from the drone operators. Um, and we were just gonna do a small little thing over at the Center for Public Humanities, and then the opportunity was presented for us to bring it to the Hoffman Refer. And so it went from having very small goals to being a large scale um, exhibit, which was really exciting, and meant that we could kind of expand our um, imaginings a little bit more and to bring in, we were just gonna do like four big photos and have that be it. So to think about how to bring in the other um, artifacts and objects that mostly um, you'll see on the labels, they're mostly from Professor Hoover. Um, so the things that Liz had collected um, and to bring in the multimedia elements, it was just a really um, kind of organic process of working with the museum staff and Greg and I. So now the questions are open to everyone. <laughs> Kelly. Um, so how did you go about collecting a lot of these photographs and quotes and just like different intellectual material from community members in a way that was both respectful and like in a way that was respectful to the community and to the project because that's something I find that I struggle with in a lot of my community like research and outreach. Yeah, um, so again, theme of collaboration. I asked my dad for help. Um, he's a bureau, of, he works for the BIA, um, but he's a natural resource manager, so he travels throughout our res a lot, so he meets a lot of people 
um, and obviously is working with natural resources. And he ended up connecting me with a lot of the people he knew in the Bears Ears area. Um, and that's kind of how it worked. And I think, honestly, by association of my dad, it got me in a lot of spaces. But I think, I mean, I think that's important. He's a respected member in our community. Um, and that was helpful <laughs> just to have him, I guess, as a connection. But I do credit him for a lot of how this exhibition came to be. Um, even just talking through things like, should I include those pictographs? Um, and I think he has a very unique perspective that I think was really helpful. And, you know, we talked through some of those things. Um, so it definitely, for me, helps to have somebody like that who you can talk about the things you're concerned about, who's also from your community and from your tribe. Um, another thing, too, was, like I said, I used Facebook. I basically was just put a call out to people that I wanted to speak with. Um, and my cousin actually wrote a book or edited a book about bears here. So again, I don't know if it's nepotism, but definitely. It's defi relationality. Yeah, relationality <laughs> definitely helped. Um, and she connected me with some people. But I think a lot of it was just, I think people knew by who I was associated with that I had good intentions. Um, and I think a lot of people, particularly with Bears Ears just wanted it to be talked about more. Um, so yeah, so I think another really important person was Regina White Skunk. Um, she was honestly one of the few like women on the um, Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition, but she was one of the most generous people with her information um, and with her knowledge, but definitely I was connected to her through my cousin um, and that helps. So I think you really, I mean, I don't know, talk about decolonization, whatever. Like, I think that's one way to do it, is that this was really, my family was really involved in this, and I thank them and credit them for that, but it definitely made me feel more comfortable to do this work. Yeah, I think um, what I'm hearing in Izzy's answer is something that Greg and I were very uh, conscious of in our exhibit too, and that's relationships. And I feel like as indigenous people, everything that we do is rooted in relationships um, and that that is something that is very important to carry over into these museum spaces as well. So the, um, the photographs and the drone and everything from Myron Dewey, uh, we only had access to because I had developed a relationship with him while we were out at Standing Rock and had an ongoing sort of friendship and um, communication with him. Um, and then through our relationships with Jen is how uh, we had access to Dean and his work. And so it just was through all of these relationships. And then of course, Professor Hoover, who is my very close friend. Uh, and that picture came from when I was texting her frantically, asking if she was okay. And she turned around and she was running away and took a photo on her iPhone. And now it is on the wall of the museum. So. Um, these relationships are really important. And in indigenous relationships, that idea of reciprocity and of um, really being in relationship as an active kind of um, thing is something that oftentimes um, a lot of museum exhibits don't uh, take on as a part of it, um, where pieces can be presented as disconnected from community and disconnected from relationships. So uh, the powerful thing about having these exhibits curated by indigenous women and Greg, who <laughs> uh, we love dearly, um, means that we can ground it in those um, those ideas of relationality. Can you say one more thing? Yeah. And then just one more thing that's, I think, more like a full circle moment than anything is actually when I was at Standing Rock when that video over there was happening. And I remember you texted me um, and were like, are you guys OK? Which was something I really appreciated. Um, and I think just speaks to all that, too. Okay. I was wondering, uh, I don't know if this is more of a question for the former member folks, but what's going to happen to the pieces that aren't, you know, besides the ones that belong to Liz, maybe they're going back to the people who they belong to for this exhibit, but what's going to happen to the rest of them? Like, are you going to have them at the museum? Just wrap them all of them? Do you know? I don't know, should I? <laughs> Bob? <laughs> 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 well, some of the objects belong to um, the yeah. curators of the exhibit, but it's a good uh, time to mention that the museum is donating two 
Izzy some of the objects that your father bought for the museum, and we're returning them to you for him, basically. Cool. So um, we're, we'll make arrangements. That's not going to happen right now because <laughs> I know you're, you know, you're traveling and everything. But we've already talked about this, and we decided that we were going to um, give whatever you want that that is appropriate for you <laughs> and your father to take. Um, we, of course, if there's something you would like to, for us to have to keep to you know, remember the exhibit by, that would be fine too, but we yeah. feel that our first responsibility is to you cool. as a curator and to your father for the role he played in helping this happen. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Oh, Jen. Um, and the, the drone will be going um, back to Myron. There's like a waiting list very long of other museums and places that would um, like mm. to it, uh, show that, so um, that's exciting that it will live on in other spaces. Jen. And I was just asking Kevin about the actual panels themselves, some of the photos, because I would like to see those um, in the community, so in a place like City Bowl College at our visitor center, or maybe their rotunda, which is kind of the heart of the campus, uh, because I think that it's still a very active issue in our community in terms of concerns over water quality and you know the hearing that just happened to potentially expand the pipeline's capacity and I think it would be great for people to know that um, there are still lots of institutions and partners out there who have spent time and um, thought deeply about these issues from a place of solidarity and allyship. So I would love to help connect you with folks at home. <laughs> and I think another thing I remember talking about when we were curating this is that people like La Pizza Arviso were kind of interested in having their photos sent to them because they're obviously beautifully framed. Um, so that would also, I think, be a nice gift, if possible. Um, and Jen, you actually helped transition this very well. Um, I wanted to make sure that we had a moment to talk about what the next steps of both of these movements are and kind of where we are headed. Um, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, I didn't know if you wanted to tell us a little bit about what's going on with um, the Dakota Access Pipeline in your community. Um, sure. So I think it was on the 13th. Um, the Public Utilities Commission in North Dakota held a hearing to consider an application from Dakota Access to more than double the capacity of the pipeline. Um, it really was a almost like a cursory act on their part. The pumping stations that would facilitate the, the capacity increase, most of them have already been built. There was only one um, pumping station that was going to be outside the original right of way, and so that's why they had to have the hearing was because they were expanding um, the range of the um, construction zone. So it's sort of a foregone conclusion, sadly. Um, but I think, you know, as with this entire movement, our young people have been, you know, really just, you know, boundless in their determination and their hope to make a, a positive public statement about how what's happening is wrong, how our tribes are still in court fighting this, and how there's still no safety plan or mitigation plan in place, um, and how the line shouldn't have been made operational in the first place. So our young people and our tribal leaders organized um, several buses to go to the hearing. Um, you know, so there were several hundred people there. The Utilities Commission actually had to stay for more than 12 hours to hear everybody who came and give them a chance to have their say. And, um, you know, they took the folks who moved out of the Sacred Stone Camp, a lot of people still standing up. Um, there's a little area in Courtney, it's called Yurtville Yurt now. Um, and people have done some really cool work on green energy projects. They've converted a old surplus bus to the Iwachomi mobile. So that was like driving around picking people up. Um, they showed up at the courthouse and everyone jumped out and put up some TVs in front of the courthouse first thing before the hearing started and some local business owner came over and was like, you guys better get ready to get arrested and people were like, you know, we're down, we're here for that. So I think that, um, you know, luckily things didn't escalate, but 
the police definitely were there with you know their concrete barriers and their array of personnel around the courthouse. And, um, but they made a point to not try to provoke any folks who had come just to really be heard. So I think you know the court cases will keep going. Earth Justice is still partnering with our tribe and doing really great work in the courts. You know the best they can in terms of trying to reverse the earlier decision, and then there's a lot of organizing across um, Ochebisha County or across our reservations because of the Trump administration's resurrection of the Keystone XL pipeline, which um, is adjacent to our relatives to the south and uh, the Cheyenne River Reservation. So that's another area um, where there's a lot of organizing happening, and there's a very high profile several hundred thousand gallons spill that happened just a few weeks ago in the original Keystone line. So it's still very much at the forefront um, you know, of our families. So it's great to see that there's still momentum in the divestment movement and um, you know, there's been a lot of attention to public activism around um, you know, working toward better sustainable energy solutions. And um, so you mentioned Earth Justice. Um, is that a place where people can be looking for updates or to donate or give uh, resources? Is yeah, that definitely. and Water Protector Legal Collective as well? Are they still? I don't know that they're so much involved with Skating Rock um, because those cases have all been settled recently. So there are still a few people. Um, there's three folks who are unfortunately serving federal prison sentences. Um, but their cases have gone through the courts. And I think Water Protector and Legal Collective actually recently relocated to the Southwest to be more involved in some of the tribes' um, extractive industry organizing campaigns there. But I definitely would think that, um, you know, just keeping an eye on the KXL organizing would be a great way to stay involved um, through, like, Indigenous Environmental Network, for example, and Earth Justice. Hello, thank you. And Izzy, do you have an update on Bears Ears? Um, I think a lot of the stuff is in the courts right now, so it's not the most exciting. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was actually, I believe yesterday, Angela Baca uh, released an article about kind of the connections between Wakanda and Bears Ears, which was really cool. I, I could only briefly look at it. Um, final season for me <laughs> but I essentially what I think he was saying is sort of that kind of like how Wakanda was an uncolonized place so is Bears Ears which is really beautiful and I think a different way to think about um, yeah a different way to think about the space but as far as I know I think most stuff is in the courts right now I know they a judge turned down a Trump lawsuit thing so I don't have the jargon for it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's definitely, I think, as you can tell, very different processes. Um, Bears Ears was going through the courts, working like tribe to tribe, government to government stuff. Um, so yeah. Um, so maybe time for one more quick question, um, and then we can turn it over to our lovely reception. So is there one last question? I'm curious if you have the, either points of tension in creating these ex exhibitions and or what you, where you felt like you may have wanted to include uh, works or that just the space perhaps wouldn't allow or um, how you worked with the space that, of, of this particular Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, a lot of the Bears Ears artwork, I guess, was graphics, so it was kind of like, how do we include all of that? Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think it, there were definitely challenges. For a while there, I was like, how am I going to fill up this space? Even though it's pretty small, it just seemed like not a lot. But I think what was cool is people like Dinesh and Adin, who, um, is in that photograph, she did the protest sign. She was a really wonderful collaborator um, and is now, I think, a 
really good friend of mine, um, and we've talked about these things a lot, but she just is like a multimedia artist, and I think it was really amazing to have her involved in this because she's kind of a model. <laughs> she's in that photograph. She's also, you know, makes these really beautiful protest signs. Um, when the exhibition opened, she actually did a performance. It was a prayer, um, but it was still cool to kind of have all these different elements um, that I think maybe the exhibit as it stands, which I, I think this is a, a challenge with the whole exhibit, is just that everything changes all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and like even just with that, you can't keep a performance space forever, right? Or a performance in this space forever. Um, so that was one thing. I mean, we wanted to include this iPad that had a lot more information that was uh, unfortunately was not able to happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the biggest challenge for me was just that everything is changing um, so quickly and so frequently. But I, I think that's why things like programming are really important. So shout out to Leah. Um, and I think that's something I've been thinking about a lot is, is programming in exhibitions, especially because I'm now in a more art historical, or I am in an art history field, which is a lot different than working in these anthropology museums that are definitely more willing to do audience-based things. Um, but yeah, that was that was a big challenge for me. I did, like the week before, I was like, should I include these petroglyphs, like these pictures, blah, blah, blah. I was really stressed out, but I ended up speaking with a native museum professional who just gave me a lot of good advice um, on that and was like, it's okay, just, you know, be respectful. Um, yeah. And I think for me, I had never curated anything before, really. I had done a little exhibit over in the CSREA um, when I was a postdoc. Um, and so this was a completely new experience on all levels. And the museum was so kind and patient. And the timeline was pretty short that we had to pull this all together. So um, I think we all learned a lot um, in the process of just uh, this is an exhibit that is largely photographs for a museum that has mostly objects, like, and thinking about what that looks like. Uh, we had to figure out how to pull screenshots from YouTube videos that could be printed large enough to be, like, visible on the wall. Like, we had to figure out how to make these screens that looped the videos. I was downloading illegal software to rip YouTube videos, like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But all of these things that, I mean, we had to learn all of it um, on the fly. And I think for Greg and I, we are academics who are very verbose and write very long things. So thinking about how to write museum labels and how to write in a voice that is accessible to an audience that is much broader than our academic community. So all of these things um, were just, it was such a great experience to learn how to take this enormous months and months long movement and all of these people and all of these moving parts and distill it into something that could be uh, like it doesn't matter which side you enter the exhibit from you can take it away like take away the same points and all of these things to think about um, it was just a really cool experience and made me want to curate more things so perhaps in the future if we can mm -hmm. figure that out I would be totally down so it's a really great experience um, and I'm really, really grateful for the chance that we had to, to do it. So, Widow, thank you all. Uh, Widow to Izzy, Widow to the museum staff. Um, thank you all for coming. And yes, I will close it there. So, thank you. Thanks.